how do people make a living economically and how do conflicts over that both divide and yet bind people? Okay. Right. So, so um, I have this scene, I, I just recently drafted it from the novel where um, um, this character comes home. Um, they, they actually go into like a, a, a meeting that's based near where they, um, they're, um, where they grew up um, of um, cooperative activist people. And they go home for dinner and they, they're having a conversation with their parents and um, the parent is asking about the business um, because they have like this really small printing press um, and it's cooperatively managed. And what I found really interesting about that conversation is that um, the, the, the parent who is, you know, sort of a upper middle class um, character, the father is unhappy with the choice of employment that um, his son has taken up and um, feels like he could have done much better. And he, it's just completely, it, it does not even occur to him the value of the work that his son is doing or why this work is important. He's looking at like, well, you know, his son is trying to tell him like, we all make a pretty good salary. And he's like, oh yeah, what's that? And then he gives a number and he's like, he just kind of scoffs at it. Um, and so I, I think that, some of this conversation is what what different people consider a good livelihood is like um whether or not you want to be comfortable or you want to be um economically you know wealthy um and that's something that i i wanted to explore in in the fiction that this character this father would just not get it and um that that to me was a really good opportunity to talk about some of the the cooperative principles because the son tries to express these things to his father and his father just does not just he does not see the value um he 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 sees it as very much um lefty nonsense and it's 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 interesting because um he comes from a, um an immigrant background he's a nigerian um guy that um came over for school um and so the the conversation I think it's one way that I explore this kind of like economic divide or this conversation about economics. Um, did I answer the question? I feel like <laughs> maybe. Okay. Um, oh yeah, it's okay. Oh yeah. She's saying that her mic didn't work. Um, Oh, I'm muted here. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that kind of hits on this that's come up for me, a, boy, on at least three different occasions now in doing uh, co-op projects or attempting cooperative projects uh, has been, and this is kind of getting back to Michael's question or comment anyway, on the lack of trust, right? Like we come into these situations, we're trying to do collective work, we're coming out of, you know, hierarchical capitalist work situations and, uh, or whatever, and have been traumatized by that, quite frankly. And the result and the scars of that trauma then make it difficult for us to do things differently. Um, like, you know, again, with the relationship metaphor, you know, you take out all the stuff that your ex did on did to you you take it out on the new partner right the same kind of um, thing and I've seen it a couple of times now um, where somebody cannot trust like for whatever reason just has such a hard time trusting that the other people in the group are not out to get them not out to screw them over and because they can't bring themselves to do that they end up acting in ways that just drives everybody else away um, and so I'd like to see fiction about that. I'd like to see that in story so people can read it and recognize themselves, hopefully and be like, oh, yes. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I had a, a personal experience uh, one time with, a, with an ex-girlfriend where she literally asked me why me and my family were being nice to her and helping her out and helping her get a job and stuff and couldn't understand. I mean, it took her a lot to get that, like, we didn't want anything back. We just want your life to be good, you know? Um, and, you know, said a lot about what she'd been through before that. Um, 
anyway, somehow I, I feel like it's all related. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, I mean, I'd like to write that kind of fiction. It's just, it, it seems to me, I mean, and I mean, I can use my imagination, but it seems to me that the, the way to do that really well or to give it justice is to actually have um, candid conversations about what those experiences are like in co-ops. Um, um, and so it's something that I, I would like to do with more partnership with, with um, people that have those experiences and so that I can have details that are actually um, from real life. But I, I also feel like that's like those, those particular moments, a moments of conflict are deeply personal for people. And so people may not want to share them or um, may not want to open up about those experiences um, even if it's going to be fictionalized. Um, and I can imagine a lot of these conflicts, um, but I can only get so far. Like I, I would need to, um, some of these things are wrapped up in the business itself, like what, what they're trying to do. And so some of that requires a lot of knowledge that would be considered insider knowledge. Like what, how do they, the, um, how do they divvy up the work that they're doing? And, um, um, what happens when someone's not doing their share or what does that look like even someone's not doing what they're um, what they, they they've committed to do um, so yeah like I, I'd love to see fiction like that too like I'm I'm totally on board with that um, yeah if anybody wants to say anything at this point just go ahead and unmute yourself um, I'll unmute you Adjoa Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about the way that fiction can be used to teach people lessons about cooperating about themselves um, and what we bring to our, our work and what we don't. And I was just wondering if you could talk some about what might be necessary or needed to kind of make this happen. I know we need some writers, but are there any other things that maybe people can um, start doing or if people want to write, you know, to contact you, what, what, what would it work? Um, I think there's a number of things that would have to happen. Um, I, and I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it on both sides. Like it's really, like I said, the culture of writers, they don't tend to want to do collaborative work. I've had conversations with, um, I, I presented this to, um, uh, a, a large group of people, a large group of writers that I'm affiliated with once. And um, some of them had had, you know, terrible experiences collaborating with other people. And so they resisted that, the collaboration because they thought that, you know, those, those experiences would repeat. Um, and because I'm, I'm still very much a baby in, in like um, thinking about cooperativism, I, I could not guarantee that those things would not happen. And I, I, do, I, do, I did not know necessarily what steps that we could take to, to try to make that not be a concern. Um, and so some of, the, some of those projects were dead in the water. Um, also, you know, a lot of people are um, busy with their own stuff and they just don't see the um, collaborative work on the, as, on the same level or of the same caliber. Um, there's some things that are changing that, like um, there's... Um, serial box which is like um serialized fiction and they they bring teams of writers in to do um prose fiction and they do audio adaptations of it and that kind of stuff and so but they're they're being contracted so i think that they see it as like a job like they come they come you know based on the contract they work together and it's not something that is they're not thinking about the culture or making their work more cooperative they're just thinking about well okay, I'm, I'm signed on for these, this many chapters or I'm signed on for, you know, this much and I'm going to do that with this group and we'll work together and, we'll, and then we'll, you know, disband afterwards. And they might not even go back to doing collaborative work again unless someone calls them to do it. Um, and then we also see examples like the Wild Cards Trust, which, um, which um, is actually like 40-something now, writers that, work, that have been building writing in a single universe. Um, and um, George R. R. Martin is heads it, and there's there's a there's like a um, they they set up a trust to you know um, 
to represent all of them as a group. And they've come out with, I don't know, like a, a few dozen, a couple dozen books. Um, I mean, which, you know, which is, which gets me excited that I know it can be done. I know people that would want to do work like that, but um, I don't know necessarily if I'll get people involved about, get people on board about writing about co-ops specifically. Um, I've been trying that. I've been talking to writers and it's, it's not that they're not interested or that they don't seem like they'd want to do it. It's just hard to build that momentum or hard to get them to like, show up um and so that that's the particular challenge on that end but i think the other challenge is that you know i think it'd be easier for writers to show up if there was and it's hard for me it's hard for me to make this kind of statement because i feel like people have the right to be as um um closed off as they would like to or or in more internal um but i i think that what it would really need is like access um it need it need um the opportunities for writers to to have really deep conversations with co-ops and have and gather the kind of details and information about the running of the business and also the the democratic process and the people involved in the conflicts and a lot of that stuff is um people consider private um or you know they you know they worry about liability or you know that kind of stuff and so I think those are the challenges, being able to get writers interested in a large enough um, a large a large enough amount so that it can actually become a genre of fiction like um and but also having conversations with co-ops that are willing to share some of those like um those important details that would make that fiction accurate to the real world, which I think is the the thing that I would want to do if I'm writing co-op fiction, I don't want to write co-op fiction as I imagine it. I want to write co-op fiction as it exists. Um, that's it. I mean, for a part, uh, a solution would be to start a co-op with writers, but um, again, finding the, the right writers and the right mindset to build that kind of co-op. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if like, if you, talk to writers and, and just say, what are your problems? Are you concerned that your contribution may not be noted as much? You might not get the credit you deserve or the money. Will there be discussion about who has the rights and who has the international rights and all of those issues? If you could compile a list of people's concerns and then go about addressing them or suggesting, oh, this is how we can handle the rights. And, um, you know, maybe it might be something that people might be willing, one or two people or three or four people might be willing to explore and see how it works out. And then, you know, you know, you can write about that and the success of that. And the other idea I had, and I don't even know how practical it is, is that um, writers could sort of, for lack of a better word, intern with the co-op. You know, if you have the time, maybe spend three months or six months or a year, say, in San Francisco, and you hang out with the, um, you know, uh, Arizmendi co-ops and learn how they do things or, you know, in Boston with Zero and just, you know, you're there every day and you're at the meetings and you're involved in the work and the struggles. So you can really get a sense of how it really is. That would be amazing. Um, I, I, I guess I know. I guess the the thing to do is to ask people if they want to do internships. Um, and I guess you know. I mean, some writers are doing their writing, you know, outside of their job. They have like a, a um, nine to five, and they write outside of that. So also making that work with their schedules and that kind of stuff. Um, And also um, whether or not co-ops would be, what kind of internship are we talking about? Are we talking about like an extensive unpaid internship? Are we talking about, you know, what, what are we talking about? Um, And I think that that might, some writers might bounce off of that or they might be like, Oh no, this is cool. This is um, research. Um, But it's one of the things that writers talk a lot about, about um, they talk about how, 
research isn't given its due or people aren't thinking about the amount of work that a writer puts into research on a topic, that it's only about words written. Um, and so there's a lot of these things that intersect and it would have to be extensive conversations about, but you also have to get people in the same room. Um, I have a, um, a collective that I've been trying to build for a few months and I, it's, it's just no one's schedule lines up. So like I'll send like doodle polls or, um, or polls like months in advance and no one, no, not one of them will line up completely. And some people have complete blocks of time that they just absolutely can't do anything. And so you have to make a commitment to meet with just a few. Um, and so that's, that's always a, a, a challenge. Um, but even if you meet with, I think that the kind of regular conversation you would need, you need to be meeting a lot all the time. And I think that that's also, you know, a problem. Like, I think this, I think it really goes back to the precarity of being a writer, that there's a lot of writers that are just trying to make it work on busy schedules. And so they, they have a lot of, they don't have a lot of time to devote to. And if they're working on their own stuff, their own stuff is going to take precedence over like mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, uh, a cooperative venture, which I don't think that should be the case, but that's, it, you know, it's the, it's the case. People, people, um, I, I reach out to people all the time and they're just like, well, I'm working on a project right now. I, uh, <laughs> I'm working on my novel. I don't know if I have the time. Um, I keep getting those kind of responses. So it's not, it's not for lack of trying. It's just, um, I think that people are busy and people have precarious, you know, existences that they're trying to manage and writing, writing tends to be the thing that they squeeze in. What if I want to give somebody else a chance to talk, but what if, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask if anybody else wanted to say anything and so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Time check, we're about uh, half an hour past right now, 30 minutes past the hour. Before that. Okay, I was wondering if, like, if we could provide an incentive, like if there was a foundation who would, say, offer, um, I mean, say if we had three writers and they could make $30,000 each, you know, or 25, that would be really great for a writer. Um, you know, just to be able to do what you love and pay your bills. And that would be the incentive to cooperate. Um, to, if you want, you can go and uh, hang out with the co-op, you know, every three months. Um, your, your, your bills and your, some of your expenses might be met. And that once you produce, then maybe there's a, a bonus to present, to produce a co-op written um, novel or piece of fiction work. I mean, it's a fantasy, you know, but it just occurred to me while you were talking that it might solve these problems because writers need money. And, you know, anything that's going to provide us a way to pay bills so that we can write our stories would really be helpful. No, you're right. It's going to, um, the money, the money problem is the, I think the big one. If you, if you present a writer with enough, um, money that they don't, they, they don't feel like they have to worry about, um, surviving, then I think that they'll be more open or inclined to doing these kind of, um, collaborative projects. I think it's a big ask right now to be like, well, let's, let's, let's experiment. Let's come together. Let's see what happens. Um, I think that people when they hear that, they're like, well, this is, this, I'll collaborate and there's no guarantee that anything good will come out of this. Um, so they, they tend to prioritize the thing that they believe in, um, which is their own work. Um, I would really like to get the culture to shift and think about collaborative work as their own work as well. Um, but I think we'd have to see, we'd have to build the kind of infrastructure you're, des you're describing. We'd have to have things in place that um, writers can do internships, writers can, you know, get money from a foundation, that there's ways that 
they can create this kind of fiction. I mean, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm working on things, but um, I really would like to do things with people. That's the, that's the thing that I, I'm excited about. Um, we got a comment here from Emmy. Uh, she says, it seems to me that putting together a brain trust of co-op enthusiasts to be part of the storyboarding process, um, but people who might not be experienced writers, that would seem possible. Uh, just to capture the humanness of the process. Um, any thoughts on that? Have a uh, yep. no. It's just heading out. Um, no, absolutely. Um, the way that I've envisioned it, and um, is Ajua has talked about it too, like the the dream is something like that, like a board of. Um, of people in co-ops and also writers. Like it's, it's a joint project. Um, that's the way that I've seen it. And I, I would hope um, that we would be able to find enough people that would be on board for doing that. I think the, hmm, I, I, I wonder if, if we just said so, like if we just put it out on, on um, geo, for example, that that's something that we want to do and that we're building it. And that, cause um, I think the impulse is to like, at least my impulse is to like draft up the structure of it first and then share the structure. But I, I think that something like this would need to be discussed. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's I totally yeah, Get on it, Emmy. <laughs> we like your idea. Um, and she, she's on the train and, and, and can't talk right now, um, either in the quiet car or possibly in Japan, I think. Um, that kind of thing is frowned upon. She said she'd love to work with this, work with us on this. Yeah, she is in Japan. Um, and I've heard talking on your phone in, in public is, <laughs> is verboten there. Um, so anyway. Um, I'd yeah. love to. If anybody has anything else. Um. Yes, I, I like to just support the idea of just putting it out there. And um, people are so creative that they'll come up with solutions. You know, just, you know, like whatever you have as far as, oh, I see it might work this way or that way, but it's totally open. Mm -hmm. And then just see what happens. I think people... Um, will come up with all kinds of ideas. And, um, you know, even maybe some funders might see it and say, hey, great idea, let me fund this. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's, you know, will hurt anything to put the idea out there. Right. You know what else I think is that um, maybe focusing on like the MFA students or even undergrads, I mean, the quality of writing might not quite be there, but they're, at least they've got the time, right? I mean, yes. Already could conceivably make things work for assignments as well. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe. Yeah. Just, me and me and Nathan. I wish. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. What were you saying? Making a snarky comment about students. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. That. Yeah. We could probably get some people in MFAs or um, undergrads to do some of this. Um, one of the things that I've been talking about, if Nathan was still here, we could have talked about it together, but we've been trying to put together a fiction antho. So um, um, uh, um, an anthology of cooperative fiction. And right now we're trying to figure out wh where we would put the stories and how we would, what, where we would get some revenue to develop the stories, per perhaps do some audio adaptations. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, this is, this is definitely something that, I think there's a need for, and that there's an opportunity here to do some stuff. And it's, we're talking about it um, with um, figuring out how to get some, some funding behind it, I think is the, the particular challenge. Because I, I mean, writers talk about this all the time, um, that there's just, people have this expectation that the writing should just be, you know, free and they shouldn't give any sort of, like they can't eat off of their writing, that it's art, so you know, why are you complaining that you're getting like two cents, you know, like, um, and so I would like to, I feel like it's, 
I would like to be just when I come to a writer. I'm like, well, you know, we're going to pay you the rate you would get if you submitted this to a magazine. Um, and so I think that's the challenge. Like, I mean, I'm sure you could find some people to volunteer the work, but I, I, I would like to, if I'm soliciting work, I'd like to do it in a way that benefits the writer monetarily as well as giving them this opportunity in this platform. What do you think, Marco? <laughs> um, I apologize for having not being visual the whole time. I was feeling kind of shy. It's nice to meet you, uh, Cadwell, and nice to meet you. Josh and Ajoa. 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 Yeah, nice. nice. And, uh, I know Nathan actually. Uh, I live in Colorado, and I've seen him at, at some local co-op events. Um, so we've hung out a few times and have some friends in common. Uh, but I just wanted to say hi uh, because I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, like I said, I was feeling shy, which is odd because I actually have done like hundreds of Zoom calls like this. Uh, but usually it's within, you know, context, kind of my own context. And I'm sort of stepping outside of, you know, my pond. And um, uh, so I guess I just want to say that, like, um, everything you're talking about now in terms of collaborative creativity and um, like empowering writers economically to bring their future visions into the world and then you know to seed that into consciousness so that it could become more part of what just how people assume the reality is rather than a fantastical possibility mm -hmm. of you know what reality could be um, so I'm doing all that like I'm working on that actually too and <laughs> I would love to talk further and like kind of connect about that. And um, I'm a poet uh, and I've tried fiction. I've tried writing some, some um, short stories and I've tried writing a novel and that, you know, I, I just hit like a brick wall and I had to stop partly because of the economics. Like it was such hard work to do the writing that, uh, and I have a family and, you know, we were dealing with mortgage and et cetera. Like, I realized I'm not, I'm not going to actually be able to write the novel unless I get, unless there's like change, you know, at, on a systemic mm -hmm. level. And then once I started thinking about that, it's like, well, you could, I don't know, you can try to get rich. You could try to, you know, you can borrow money. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to personally take care of money issues, but it doesn't really solve the problem more, more broadly. So, and you know, I just started thinking, well, then how does that, if you follow the implications of, of that logic or that argument, like you have to start thinking about bigger structural change and how to make it possible for all the talent and all the imagination, all the capability that human beings have to imagine different futures than what's presented to us. Like how do you free that up and then start applying it like in the positive direction? Because there's plenty of negative visions about how things could be. And, um, you know, it's not black and white, like negative or positive dystopian or utopian. In a utopia, you can have a lot of complexity and a lot of drama. Um, but you still have to have like the intention for a better future. And that's what I think is often lacking in the so-called, you know, literary culture or, you know, creative, the apolitical thing you were talking about earlier. It's like, we can be very creative, but we're, it's within this just aesthetic it's just under aesthetic realm and then that, that's very easy to commoditize but real transformative creativity is not it's not really there to be commodified it's actually there to move things in a different direction mm -hmm. and that's what i feel like um like writing like social fiction like you call it so which is a beautiful play on science fiction um i feel like is doing so i just really appreciate the the, com the conversation that you've been having and it's really radical and bold. Like this title of Nathan's book, everything for everyone. I mean, just the title of the book alone, I haven't read it yet. I would love to, um, it's on my list. Um, but if people took that seriously, like how far, how deep does that go? Um, and then like if your fiction just takes that seriously and then jumps off the page into like, let's actually make that happen. I think that that's really where the transformative power is. And I'm very excited by what you're doing. And I loved your story, um, Monsters Come Howling in Their Season. The idea of a, uh, 
an AI that is common to everybody. Um, it's be wonderful. Uh, like that really could be a reality. There's no reason that that has to just be a fiction. There's no reason, you know, technically it could be real, exactly what you're, what you're describing. So, yeah, like let's, I, I want to make it real. Like let's actually build that AI. Like I don't have the personal technical skills to do that. Like I can right. write the code or anything, but I mean, just putting the idea out there and like, how would that actually work? And what would be the kind of, you know, like what would be the things we would imagine could go wrong or would be weird, like the conversation there. And what was so interesting, I'll just say this, and I know I'm rambling, but I haven't talked the whole time. Um, like the conversation between Terry and Common, where Terry realizes that Common is um, demurred, like doesn't want to say how that, that it or she feels sad, uh, but you're not sure. Like does she, she feels glad when she can save people. So she must be able to feel sad, I thought. But it's like not saying that is part of her sentience. It's part of like her sensitivity uh, that some things can't be spoken so easily. Uh, and anyway, I, I don't know what else to add. I'm going to send you, you know, I'll, I'll message you uh, to, to follow up if you're interested in, in talking further. Um, but I think it's brilliant. Yes, absolutely. I'm interested in, in, um, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just reach out. Um, I, I could talk endlessly about, um, my hopes for this kind of stuff, but I feel like when I go to the, when I go to the theater and I look at the end credits and I see so many people working together on a project, like, it seems to me like this could happen cooperatively. Like it's, it's not, it's not something that should just be relegated to um, corporate big budget movies that this is um, that artists can come together on their own and cooperatively organize around a project. Um, so like, if we're talking about like big, big hopes and dreams, like I, I would like to see not just like fiction, short stories and books, but I would like to see music and, um, and TV and, and film um, like art forms, in all of these different medias, um, all of these different mediums um, that are using cooperative practice. Um, yeah, we can just, yeah, please. Well, please I mean, it, just the hypothesis, how would that change the art if all the artists were cooperators rather than individual, you know, um, subjects who are mm -hmm. in competition with each other for status or money or fame or whatever, like if they were all, just how would that change the art is, is what I'm really curious about. I think it'd make it better. Um, I, I feel like the culture that we have right now pits artists against each other and the artists that get successful um, then are, they get to decide how they engage with the community. Um, and then most other writers just have to struggle or most other artists just have to struggle to, to get their, their voice to be heard or to, um, create to have the time to create the work that they they're passionate about and i think that there's an opportunity to equalize that that is um there's a lot of places where um instead of artists competing they're collaborating and through that you can create more complexity more texture um people are bringing a lot of their um their perspectives to the work like i think about um even I mean, if we're going to use like um, Game of Thrones, for example, George R. R. Martin's like um, series of books, like, imagine if that was written by multiple people. Um, imagine if they were bringing all their perspectives to that work. What, how that work looked different? Um, how would, um, what would it be saying that would be different than what its current iteration is saying? Um, yeah, I wholeheartedly think that if artists were to be more cooperative, it would definitely change the art for the better. At least that's my hope. Yeah, I actually think that the work would be so much better in the same way that when we brainstorm an idea, we get all these ideas and we come up with something that nobody alone would have thought about. And so even using the Game of Thrones analogy, I read the books, but the, the, the uh, television uh, series is so much better. And I think that's because all these uh, 
our um, writers are cooperating on it and coming up with different angles and everything. And so the, the, the TV is just, in a lot of ways, just more exciting than the book. So I think the same thing would happen with cooperative uh, writing. In I mean, a practical book, sense. Oh, sorry, Josh. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this, what I've been sitting here thinking, like, actually, a lot of our pop culture writing is done cooperatively, right? Like, pretty much every TV show, you've got a writer's room, and there's not generally one writer for most of the stuff that we're consuming, at least in that medium. I know it's, you know, very different, obviously, for novels and, and um, stuff like that. But um, unfortunately, I don't think the uh, cooperative writing made the Big Bang Theory any better than it would have been if somebody had just written it on their own, right? I mean, this, it, The Simpsons or something, you know, it works. Um, but, but to me, I, it's like, well, there's already kind of this example that is not an odd thing at all for at least particular types of writers uh, that you would be in a room with four or five other people and you're all coming up with the story together. That's like the way that a lot of the, the writing happens. Um, so yeah, it'd be great if we could, you know, we had our own, you know, publishing company, production studio or whatever. Um, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, we need to just set up a joint um, Patreon or Libra pay or whatever the, the non-corporate version is, you know, and um, just be constantly pitching it if you want good uh, fictional content or whatever good content about uh, co-ops throw a you know, a few dollars in the, in the Libra pay. And then when there's enough, we can pay somebody to actually write a story and you know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I feel like when we're talking about things like Big Bang or um, any TV show, really, the, the structure of it is so hierarchical that I don't like, it seems to me that even if those writers in those writers' rooms wanted to do something that was challenging in the medium, they're constrained by so many forces above that they, they kind of have to fit the mold that has been set out for them. Um, if there was a truly cooperative like, project like that, a, a truly cooperative TV show, then the writers' room would be making a lot of the decisions on the story and they would get to bring in perspectives and, and, and people and um, do, do, um, do the research or collaborate with um, people in different sectors. They would, have, they would have that opportunity to decide where the budget goes. And instead of like paying one or two actors to sell the show, they would be focusing on um, making the show f more representative of the real world through collaboration with people that are living in the real world. Um, I mean, it's... I mean, I could talk forever. Well, it's hard to escape economic incentives, uh, and they're very insidious. And even if you're a person of very good intentions and good heart, if you're in a system that is kind of trying to make you go this way, uh, and you're the only one who's trying to go this way, it's, it's, it's very hard, I think. And even in these big productions, which I think are definitely examples of uh, cooperation and um, even genius, like I, I would call them like collective genius, like a movie, Take a movie like and, and any brilliant movie, 2001. I mean, it's an example of collective genius. It is driven by the you know the, the director's vision in, in that particular case. But um, but there's still the economic incentive when you're doing a project to make the money to pay back the investors to keep the whole capitalist game going. I imagine that a cooperative of writers and artists uh, would have a different um, objective, like their ultimate objective, sure, there'd be like the necessity to sustain the organization and to, you know, to be funded enough to actually manifest what they're envisioning. But really what, I mean, what the ultimate value would be, would be, I think, the, you know, the evolution of, of consciousness or the evolution of, of culture and healing the world and, um, exp you know, getting beyond our kind of li very kind of backwards problems in a way, you know, are sort of lim very limited thinking so that we can think about much bigger possibilities. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that that is a wonderful, uh, that's the dream like that, that I share that um, if you change, 
it has to happen in all levels. It can't just be economic. It can't just be systems. It has to be how people are because we're also traumatized. Like that's another thing you all were talking about. Like we're traumatized by the history, all the history of capitalism and colonialism and um, various, many forms of oppression, et cetera. So there's a lot of inner healing work that has to be done in addition to systemic change, like in addition just to hardcore, like organizing and activism and not, no one person can do it all. So we need to have these like collective and cooperative sort of federations that are like closely enough, um, like more, have share similar enough goals and values, but are diverse and differentiated enough that they could really do a lot of different things. Um, And, you know, once you have food and transportation and, um, you know, the very, like, once you fulfill the functions of various social needs, then you have a different civilization, ultimately. Like, if we could have, if we could link together food and transportation and cultural production, like, and uh, politics and spirituality and, like, everything else that makes a whole human life and just shift it from one set of assumptions to another set of assumptions that are instead of, you know, death drive driven, (laughs) life driven, uh, and, you know, are operating for the benefit of all of us rather than for the benefit of very few people who are profiting off of all of us. Um, that, that to me is what is needed. Like that's what we need to do. Uh, and it's urgent because other, you know, this is the Titanic. We're on the Titanic right now, right? <laughs> Basically. Uh, and so, you know, the people like you, Cadwell and Nathan, all, all of, I, I don't, I don't know that much about Geo. I just got introduced to your organization, but it sounds like this is basically what you're doing too, is linking together diverse groups. Um, yeah, like I, f- I feel like we need to sort of get our minds together and connected and, and, you know, actually kind of get coherent in, in a way, um, to, to make that shift. I think part of the problem with the investors is that the investors aren't, they, they don't tend to be the community that's um, engaging with the art. And so if we could figure out a way to make the investors of these art projects, the actual community that's engaging with this art, um, I think would be, I, I think that that would also move us in the right direction. Um, uh, executives tend to be the people with the money that have the resources to say, well, okay, you can make this, but if, but communities tend to pay to engage with this media too. And so if they, as, as a group can raise the funds to make projects happen, I think that that's another way that we could, um, you know, answer the question of accountability, um, but also um, allow for a, a bit more freedom for the, for the creatives to work on things that, their community actually wants them to work on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, which is probably a pretty far fetched idea in this country. Um, but the fun stuff like this is something like a cooperative mill levy. Um, you know, uh, in Puerto Rico, for instance, they do this where there's a, a sectoral cooperative kind of apex organization and every co-op on the island is required by law to put some percentage of their net uh, profits or surplus into uh, funding. And this organization, you know, provides education and, and uh, you know, just a whole lot of services to co-ops. Um, and, you know, that, that would be the, I, I would think, the kind of ideal funding mechanism for, uh, you know, creatives, writers doing work, you know, that, that could be funded by the movement, um, which would then also be, you know, hopefully provide the, the relationship ends um, to, to be able to, you know, do your background research and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, short of that, uh, some sort of Kickstarter or, or Patreon type situation, I would think might be a something to really look at. And if we could get, I mean, we have some very large co-ops in this country. I mean, Ocean Spray, Land of Lakes, all of the, you know, hundreds, I think, of electrical co-ops um, that actually have some real revenue. Um, the, you know, Cinex is a co-op. So I may not 
love everything that Synex does, but um, you know, if we can really pitch them on, hey, we need to make this a more cooperative world, and you could, you know, do that by pitching into this uh, cooperative media fund or whatever it is. Um, that would, you know, there could, I mean, they give that tens of thousands of dollar grants away to people to do all kinds of stuff. So, you know, this should be right, right at the end. Um, That's a great we, point, by the way. I mean, there's plenty of money out there. There's no lack. I mean, think of all the crypto billionaires and stuff. Like, like there's people who want soul. They want like new visions. They want new ideas. Like it's just having a lot of money, but not, but in, in a crappy culture is no fun. Um, I think it's just a matter of kind of framing it and making the pitch and getting the word out. Um, and I want to say some, like respond to the point Cadwell about artists and community, because I think that's a really important one. Um, like there, you know, we've kind of put in commerce in between that relationship of Art, the artists in the community that would receive the work and give feedback and for whom the artist is creating and suffering and you know doing all their other and I feel like there's an opportunity to restore that rela relationship where you know the artist is not somebody who's the solitary genius who's a, you know out beyond everybody else and is on the pedestal like I, I kind of think that art culture literature we should look at it more like food it's just food for a different part of ourselves. Like we eat vegetables and grain, whatever else we eat to serve our, our physical bodies. We need to replenish the molecules literally that, you know, constitute our body. I think it's the same with culture. It's, it's just another kind of food that people need. And, um, and, you know, much like with the CSAs and, and you know, the, the food movement and local agriculture and relocalizing, like, in creating, you know, building a network of, of farmers markets and things like that. There could be something like that for, for the arts and for culture where we're like kind of relocalizing culture uh, because we're recognizing that it's not just some, and it's not just entertainment to get be distracted from how miserable you are, you know, working for the man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually like part of just what a healthy human life needs. And so having cultural creators who are supported just like anybody else who's contributing to the community, um, like in a, in a cooperative context where it's not for profit extraction and it's not for mass distraction, it's for, um, it's for nourish, it's like collective nourishment. Uh, that to me would be really restorative uh, of like what I think was the original purpose of art. It's kind of how it arose to form human communities. It's to, to create coherence, to create resonance amongst people. Uh, to have shared symbols, shared objects. Um, so I, I liked being idealistic. I think the cooperative framework helps you. It, it forces you to be a bit practical because it is still a business. You still have to survive in the kind of in the capitalist, you know, uh, jungle. Uh, and it's dangerous out there and cooperatives get, you know, taken out all the time. They're hard even to start. Um, but uh yeah, I guess we're at time. I really appreciate really? the, the yeah, talk. Um, yeah, Cadwell, uh, since uh, this was kind of your uh, get together, it, I'll give you the last word if you've got anything to say for not just the people here, but everybody online, the hundreds of thousands of people in sure watch this on YouTube. Go oh, for geez. it. Oh, no geez. pressure. <laughs> um, no, this, this was a really, really great conversation. And, um, I'd, I'd like to have more of these. Um, I, I just feel like I've been, I've been starved for this kind of talk. Um, and it's, it's great to be among people that are enthusiastic about similar things and would like to see some of this happen in the world. I don't think that we have to start off with something particularly ambitious, you know, um, something small scale, something that can be managed. Um, you know, really just recently, I've just been thinking about just getting two other people together and starting like a writing co-op and just writing stories. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to be uh, a source of livelihood right away, but it'll be something that, you know, is a good starting ground for 
the type of practice we're talking about. You know, they need to you need to start somewhere. It seems to me, you know, doing something small would would be a good opportunity. Um, that is all I have to say. <laughs> um, I'm grateful to everybody that that showed up and for all the great questions and um, and for listening to me ramble. Um, thank you. All right.